Good evening. I'm David Lynn, editor of the Kenyan Review, at least for the next several weeks. At the end of this month, I shall step aside as editor after 26 incredibly wonderful years and welcome Nicole Therese Dutton as my successor. I know she will be a tremendous leader of our literary efforts. But for now, I'd like to welcome you to the first week of In a Few Words, featuring brief conversations between the distinguished faculty of the KR Writers Workshops and the Peter Taylor Fellows, emerging writers selected on the basis of their promising work. The series of these conversations will continue for another three weeks. But first, I must take a moment to acknowledge the strange, disorienting, and disturbing times in which we find ourselves. The coronavirus pandemic had already disrupted societies across the globe and caused us to cancel our famous residential summer programs. When the brutal murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis set off a wave of outrage and protest equally worldwide. On behalf of all of us in the Kenyan Review family, I want to make clear our support and solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and more generally with efforts to create a more just and equitable society. Usually, our summers here in Gambier, Ohio include long, vibrant days of writing and reading and sharing, of generating new creative work in workshops and in personal instruction, deep conversation and public readings. While that is not possible this year, we offer you this free sampler of the faces, the relationships, and the kind of conversation that makes the Kenyan Review Writers Workshop such a rich experience. This week, you'll be listening to Carl Phillips and Paul Tran, Caitlin Horks and Rachel Heng, Rebecca McClanahan and Larry Palmer, Ira Sukrungrung and Alicia Soshin, and Dan Beachy Quick and Abby Chabot-Noy Kerstetter, as they read from each other's work and then share what most, most struck them about their choices. The Kenyan Review is devoted to nurturing, publishing, and celebrating the best in contemporary writing. We are always striving to expand the community of diverse readers and writers across the globe and at every stage of their lives. We cannot do this work without you. If you are able to make a donation in these difficult times, please consider a gift of five, 10, $25 or more by clicking the button at the bottom of your screen. And now, please enjoy a taste of the Kenyan Review Writers' Workshop in a few words. Hello. Hi, Paul. Uh, it's great to see you, even a la distance, yes. as they say. And, um, and I guess I should say to our audience um, that um, Paul was going to be um, my Peter Taylor fellow this summer at the Kenyan Review Writers Workshop. Um, and obviously things have changed. Um, uh, well, what changed is not that Paul's not going to be the fellow, but that the whole thing isn't happening. Um, and so what we're gonna do is um, read a poem by each other and then sort of say something and we hope you enjoy it. So I'm going to read Paul's poem, um, Galileo, uh, which I believe I saw first in workshop and later I saw it on the Academy of American Poets um, poem a day site, very exciting. All right, here it is, Galileo. I thought I could stop time by taking apart the clock. Minute hand, hour hand, nothing can keep, nothing is kept, only kept track of. I felt passing seconds accumulate like dead calves in a thunderstorm of the mind no longer a mind, but a page torn from the dictionary with the definition of self effaced. I couldn't face it, the world moving on as if nothing happened. Everyone I knew got up, got dressed, went to work, went home. There were parties, ecstasy, Hennessy, dancing around each other, 
bluntness, blunts rolled to keep thought after thought from rolling, from roiling like wind across water, coercing shapelessness into shape. I put on my best face. I was glamour. I was grammar. Yet my best couldn't best my beast. I too have been taken apart. I didn't want to be fixed. I wanted everything dismantled and useless, like me. Case, wheel, hands, dial, face. So that's a, a very powerful moving poem. I thought so when I first heard it in its original version. And I <clears throat> don't know if I said this long ago in workshop, but what I, I've always thought that what makes a poem successful is a meaningful tension between two opposing things. And, and one thing that's interesting about the form of this poem is how, although it's, the poem speaks about wanting to take things apart, throughout the poem, you can see the poem trying to announce its connectedness. And so you see that in lines like, nothing can keep, nothing is kept. So keep and kept bring those things, those fragments or those sentences together. And then the next one after nothing is kept is only kept track of. So it's what is known as a concatenated form where each line, it seems to be linked to the last by one word or some variation of a word being repeated. So that was exciting at a level of form. But also it turns out that for me anyway, this poem is also very much about another kind of tension between concreteness and abstraction, I suppose. This desire to stop time, which is abstract, by dismantling it in some concrete form, like taking apart um, a watch, a clock. Um, or another example, later in the poem, we have this simile about time, which is an abstraction, time in terms of the seconds of a, of a moment, but they're described as the concrete calves. I read that as the animal calves in a thunderstorm, which is concrete, but it turns out to be a thunderstorm of the mind, which is an abstraction, which then morphs to the concrete page, which contains the abstract word self, but then the self has been kind of wiped out, defaced. So, um, I'm interested in that and how there are these concrete rituals of daily life, like work and parties and dancing and drugs that are all supposed to keep abstraction at bay. They keep shapelessness from becoming shape, as is mentioned later in the poem. But then eventually there's a succumbing to or desire for, in a way, the abstract beast inside the self. And, you know, this sort of half longing not to be fixed and I'm interested in the double meaning of fixed, not to be fixed as in corrected, um, but also not to be static. So there's so much going on in that poem and it's very exciting to me and I'm very excited to read it though I know I sort of messed up one word there, but corrected it. But Paul, I believe you also have a poem you want to chat about. I do, I do. Um... Hi everyone, my name is Paul Tran and I'm reading the poem, Teaching Ovid to Sixth Graders by Carl. Teaching Ovid to Sixth Graders. Easy enough now, listening to this uneven rustle of sleeved arms over paper to imagine what Ganymede heard, desire and the new life to be spent bending for a body that had already undone so many on wings approaching. I look at their arms, things I sometimes have thought I would not mind learning in my own way to love. And I wonder, even now, after Ganymede and all the other names I have told them for the flesh in defeat, what do these bodies know really, that I wanted them to, how any myth is finally about the lengths the mind will carry a tale to, to explain what the body already knows and so never answers, that there is no way to explain what can happen 
what can take a life that does not mean harm, just as suddenly and terribly down for all that. Pacing the aisles, I dream my mouth to each ear, the lesson beginning all over again, but different. Um, I have my cheat sheet before me of what I'm going to say, so I'm just going to read my cheat sheet. I chose this poem by Carl for this occasion because it reminds me that a function of a poem, and by that logic, a function of a poet, is to make an argument based from experience and observation. Here, our speaker, a teacher in a sixth grade classroom, argues that what we call myth is finally about the lengths the mind will carry a tale to, to explain what the body already knows and so never answers, that there is no way to explain what can happen. This argument, so plain and yet so painful, emancipated me from both the faults of my poem and the faults of my personhood. I for so long had thought that there was a reason for everything. I needed everything to have a reason in order to explain and to redeem the extremities my family and I had endured. I thought reason could save me. And yet my early poems failed to arrive at reason, at the emotional and psychological landscapes that such an arrival would take me through and take me to. I wrote more or less autobiographical poems that failed to say something, to make an argument about what it is and what it means to be human in a time and place. But this poem by Carl taught me to say something. This poem taught me to use autobiography, not in the service of announcement, but in the service of discovery. It taught me that a function of a poem is to help first the writer and then the reader learn something new or to reconsider what we thought we knew. I learned that there is no way to explain what can happen, that life, like violence and survival, is random and messy. And I see my timer clicking, and so I'm gonna to skip to the end. And while I can't answer if the sixth graders in the classroom know really what the speaker wanted them to, or whether knowledge can be known without pain, I do want to say that as one of his students, I've been very lucky to learn what Carl has taught and continues to teach me, even if it takes me a while to get there. And I thank you, Carl, for this gift, this lesson that each time I read begins all over again, but different. Well, thanks for the gift of allowing me to teach you and to get to know you and your work, which is very powerful indeed. Hi, uh, I'm Caitlin Hawks. I'm an instructor for the Kenyon Review Writers Workshop, uh, and I'm here with wonderful writer and Peter Ta Taylor fellow Rachel Heng. Um, I'm going to share a short passage um, from about halfway through Rachel's novel Suicide Club. Uh, our main character, Lee, has snuck into a party where she's not supposed to be, um, and this is not the kind of thing she usually does. All of a sudden, Lee noticed the smell. It threaded its way through the haze of floral perfumes laced with a not unpleasant trace of perspiration. The people at the party were, after all, the sort to perspire sparingly and sweetly. It was a nutty, burnt odor, and yet strangely appealing. It was achingly familiar, yet difficult to place, like a memory from a previous life. A tall man in a tux stood at a grill. He flashed Lee a grin full of square white teeth as she approached and then turned his attention back to the sizzling food. When she saw what was on the grill, a bitter taste rose in her throat and her stomach clenched. Great slabs of oozing meat dripped red blood onto the coals, thick and marbled with milky white. She couldn't tell what it was, pork, beef, lamb, or, or something else altogether, having only ever seen red meat in the ministry posters that warned against colorectal damage. How would you like yours? The man said to her. She saw that his white shirt unbuttoned at the neck was splattered with oil. Excuse me, Lee choked, stepping backward. She brought a hand to her nose in an attempt to block out the fumes. 
stomach turning now that she saw where they came from. Medium rare, he said. That's what I'd recommend with a cat like this, but you look more like a well-done kind of lady. He was broad-shouldered and smooth-cheeked, with no sign of premature degeneration that she could spot. He was the kind of man that her mother invited to dinner parties, a fine specimen who could even be ministry. Yet here he was, at a party like this, grilling contraband animal flesh. The steaks were slowly turning reddish-brown, a rich, earthy color. How could anyone bear to put something so bloody into their systems? Lee tugged at the hem of her dress, suddenly wishing she'd worn something looser. Sweat gathered at the backs of her knees and under her arms. The man was still looking at her. I, uh, no, no thank you, she said. Suit yourself, he turned back to the girl. She imagined him sinking his perfect white incisors into the soft red flesh, juices coating his tongue, the charred animal scent filling his nose. Her stomach lurched again, but this time it wasn't revulsion, she felt. It was unmistakably a kind of desire, so powerful that it scared her. Uh, and uh, she goes on to explore the party. Um, the, one of the reasons I chose that passage uh, the world of the book um, is one uh, where life extending treatments have become available. Um, Lee is, is a lifer. Uh, she's a hundred years old in that scene, um, but like her, her compatriots um, looks, looks maybe in her, her 20s. Uh, and these treatments are available to people um, who meet certain physical criteria, who have a certain amount of like social status and wealth, uh, and who agree to abide by certain rules. Um, so she has spent most of her life uh, getting some exercise, but not too much. Um, very rarely eating sort of what we would think of as like real food. Um, she, she sips Nutrifax. Uh, and one of the, uh, there's many wonderful things about the book, um, but one of the, the great pleasures for me are these little moments uh, that look at, at our world and the things that we take for granted um, and sort of recalculate it um, according to this very different uh, equation um, of what what extends life or, or what they consider worthwhile or what they consider um, uh, pleasurable or, or allowable. Um, so there's there's just wonderful details like almost no one listens to real music in the book. Um, it's considered too um, stressful or, or arousing to the emotions. Um, so they listen to recordings of like rainforest sounds and, and mandolin and, and birdsong. Uh, and those um, uh, those moments, like like just sort of trying to place the scent of meat on a grill, uh, I really really enjoyed, um, and and have also just in our the, the book came out in two thousand eighteen, um, but reading it now in the time of coronavirus, I certainly just thinking about how things that you know three months ago were completely normal, um, like eating dinner in in a crowded restaurant, um, now take on this totally different charge of either impossibility or inaccessibility or, or danger or, or just difference. Um, and, and reading a book like this that kind of refracts our own world back at us um, is, is really interesting right now. So thank you for writing it. Thank you. Thanks so much. I haven't heard anyone read from it because I haven't been able to listen to the audiobook out of sheer embarrassment. So that was really lovely. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read um, a piece of flash fiction um, by Caitlin, and um, it's titled In Our Country, and I think likewise it's, it's something that came out several years ago but feels strangely prescient and very, um, well, disturbing and comforting at the same time. This country used to be pronounced like this, now we pronounce it like this. Old people or foreign people, you know them from the way they say it, wrong. There is famine in that country now, there is plague, no, now no one goes there. Even the people who live there, they try to leave. This country, and when I say this country, I never mean my country, I mean this other country over there, was once one country, but now it is four. This country is now two. This country still pretends to be one, but is really 100. This country was never a country, but all the countries around it chose to believe that it might become so. This country was never a country, but faraway countries chose to believe it might. This country, oh, sorry. In this country, the war has not started yet. In this country, the war continues. In this country, the war stopped, but it left nothing behind that you would care to see. When I was young, no one traveled to this country. Now it is safer, but not too safe, so that you can go there for nothing. For nothing, you can see all the places you were once so afraid of. Now another country is the one we do not travel to. 
Now there is some place else to be afraid of. In this country, people once lived there, but now they live over there. They moved because they were afraid. They moved because they didn't have to be afraid anymore. They moved to be closer to people of their own religion, own language, own color, own food, own way of saying good night and good morning. They moved when someone else moved them. In this country, they moved and then moved back again. In this country, they moved until the land they had was land where nothing grew and the people starved. In this country, they moved until the land. Oh, sorry, I keep losing my place. In this country, they moved until the land. They moved until the land they had was land where nothing grew and the hungry people killed each other. In both countries, the mover said, we did not kill you, this is not our fault. In this country, they eat with their right hands. In this country, they eat with their left. In this country, they have so little to eat, other countries choose to believe the starving are beyond preference, but they are not, and they pray with both hands before eating. In this country, God is capitalized, and in this country, he's not, and in this country, he's many, and in this country, he is nearly less than one. In this country, they speak to him like this, and in this country, like this, and in this country, the people worry that she doesn't like to be spoken to at all, but they cannot stop trying. No country thinks itself an orphan. In our country, we are never afraid because it is our country. In our country, we are always afraid because it is our country. Good night, we say, in the way we say it in our country. And in our language, that phrase means many different things. Sleep well, sweet dreams, wake in a place the same or better. Do not wake in a place that is worse. Let it be worse in some other country. Good night, we say, good night. And I just, I, I love this so much. I think when I read it, I got goosebumps because um, I guess just on, the, on a craft level, the kind of way that um, the repetition becomes a kind of chant um, and like an incantation and feels, you know, kind of prayerful, but also ominous. Um, and that line between like the threat, the menace um, and the comfort and that sense of community was really powerful to me. Um, and also that defamiliarization of like the, this country and trying to figure out like, okay, which country are we talking about? And then realizing that, you know, this applies to so many situations across time, like across ancient history and today. Um, and I think in this particular moment as well, um, so I'm from Singapore and my, my partner, so my husband's from Switzerland, but he's also part Lebanese and part Swedish. And we obviously live in the US. So we're hearing all these stories of coronavirus in like this country and that country. And every single country is sort of saying that every other country is doing something wrong or doing something right. And it changes every single day. And just that feeling of the sort of arbitrariness um, of these like boundaries that we've drawn feels, you know, particularly um, obvious in this moment, like something that we've taken for granted, you know, the solidity of those boundaries and like them becoming so solid because we're unable to cross them but at the same time feeling so arbitrary um, because obviously, you know, viruses travel, yeah, easily, whether we control it or we close those borders or not. Um, so yeah, this piece just felt I actually looked up to see when when you wrote it because it felt so so specific and like powerful to this moment. And actually, it was yeah in 2015, I think. I don't know if we have any time, but I love I love to hear about. Okay, we have to wrap up. Sorry, <laughs> but yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you for writing it. Hello. I'm Rebecca McClanahan, and uh, this is Larry Palmer, my uh, fellow uh, to be to be next next summer, I guess. This is, feels to me uh, as a um, someone very new to Zoom. It's like, uh, honey, I shrunk my fellow <laughs> movie or something. I mean, he's a very tall guy, and and look he, how little he looks. I'm so impressed he could do that, um, but. I'm just so delighted to introduce Larry and uh, his wonderful new book, which is Scholarship Boy, and it just came out. And uh, I'm going to read a little bit from it. And um, it was very, very hard for me to choose a particular passage, like one or two paragraphs from this very deep and far-reaching book. Um, but I picked this section near the beginning because personal uh, connection with it. When uh, Larry was in my workshop about seven years ago, I believe. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he was a mere lad. But uh, anyway, um, 
we worked on this. Uh, we sat at, at the Kenyan Review uh, at the Inn, I mean the Kenyan Inn, and talked about this beginning section. And um, so I have a connection but to it, but also because it's about the young Larry, age 14, who's moving into a new part of his, of his life, uh, leaving, as he called, his loving but chaotic family in St. Louis, uh, to a very new world, uh, the scholarship world um, of Exeter. Um, I felt that it was this, this moment, and he's very divided in this moment. And I think that we talked about Faulkner's quote, the human heart in conflict with itself. Um, and how that makes for important writing. And so I picked this because I think it shows that dividedness. So I'll read um, a couple of paragraphs from there. The Sunday in 1958 when I left St. Louis, I sat in my coach seat in Union Station quite a while, going over my parents' instructions in my mind. I was to change trains in Cleveland that night and take another train to Boston. Once in Boston, early the next morning, I was to take a taxi to North Station, where I would board a third train north to a small New Hampshire town that I, my parents, and my nine siblings had never seen. As the train pulled slowly out of the station into the darkness of a tunnel, I wasn't conscious of the fact that there had not been any special goodbyes to Al, Willie, or any of my other brothers or sisters. As the engine sped up and we emerged once more into the bright September morning, I could see the bridge over the Mississippi River into Illinois. I tried to imagine the new world I was about to enter. And as the train hung there above the current, tears began to flow down my cheeks. I looked back at the smokestacks of St. Louis's factories, reached for my handkerchief and buried my face in it against the window so that none of the people around me would notice how the confident smile I'd worn during mom and dad's farewells had disappeared. And I love that section. Um, well, I love the, the image of the train hanging above the current. Uh, you, you always think of a train being so, of course, grounded. It's got to be grounded. It wouldn't move. But it's hanging there in suspended animation, um, just like the boy is. And he's able in this moment to both look back and to look forward and to be suspended. I just thought that was so beautiful. Um, so that's why I chose that part. And, um, and thank you. I read the whole book and I wrote a long blurb um, that is not a haiku, uh, and uh, it was wonderful. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you in real time and not in this little box next summer, Larry. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Uh, I'm going to talk about the passage. I, I, I'm going to give you the passage before I give you my reasons for choosing it. Uh, I chose a passage from one of your essays that first appeared in the Kenyon Review titled and we shall be changed, September 7th through 11th, 2001. A few pages into this essay, it's apparent that a squirrel who invaded your apartment through a chimney on September 7th is a major character in your 9-11 transformation. With the help of your husband, you managed to entice him to leap through an open window of your fifth floor sublet. He resides trapped on your tiny Juliet balcony, I love those, that description, surviving on home delivery of peanuts from you and your husband. <laughs> on the morning of September 11, you managed to trap the squirrel in a catch and release carrier. You, the heroine of squirrel rescue, decided to walk to nearby Central Park to release him in a more suitable habitat. When you open the cage gate, as you write, nothing happens. The squirrel is silent. He doesn't budge. I gather some acorns and place them in front of the open gate. In the distance, a siren starts wailing, then another and another. There must be a big fire somewhere. I look up but see no smoke, just green stretching in all directions and the blue sky wedged in small pieces between the branches. The squirrel peeks out of the carrier. 
his head darting from side to side, his whiskers twitching, he sniffs, his head bobs, and then in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, he's gone. I watch until there's no sign of him anywhere, just a shiver in the highest branch besides the patch of blue, blue sky. Your book has many examples of your writing as word paintings, but I chose this particular passage because of the, the Messiah music and for the fact that it brought about my own suffering. Um, just briefly, my son was an airman, a senior airman in the Air Force at LaGuardia Air Force Base and he, September 11, 2001 happened to be his 22nd birthday. So I imagined that he was eating breakfast after an all night shift and um, as those planes were deployed from Langley Air Force Base in, in Virginia, as soon as the tower, first tower was hit, war might be in his future. The reason why I love this story so much is that you managed to rescue a squirrel trap five stories high on your balcony while hundreds of thousands of our fellow human beings were trapped in hundred story towers. Despite the efforts of those many firemen who went to their certain deaths that we heard. The ending of your piece helped me to recall that the best of the human heart responds to suffering with both generosity and mourning. Thank you. Thanks so much. You know, Larry, that, that in the twinkling of an eye, um, that would never survive in one of my workshops because it's a cliche. But of course, it's from the lyric of the oratorio, the Messiah. So uh, I did put it in italics in the book. And yes. um, I actually listened to that <laughs> when we wrote this this morning. I listened to it. Oh, you a, a mystery. It's a wonderful image. And I, I love um, the architecture of it in some ways. The five foot fall or whatever height he fell to the fifth floor in your apartment to hundreds of people falling out of that building. Um, it was beautiful and um, I enjoyed the whole book tremendously. Some of the things, the next essay on 8th Avenue are the family that has the two children um, who are switching children early in the morning on the subway because he's doing the night shift, she's doing the day shift. It's just, it's just an amazing, um, story of a great city. Yeah, a it's good, ordinary, as is what is happening right now in New yeah, York City. It's ordinary people doing extraordinary yeah, things. Yeah. And that's what, you know, literary nonfiction is all about, right? The, the <laughs> ordinary, the real people. And that's what we try to write about. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, Larry. Yeah, and you. I hope to see you. And I'll thank you, Ken and Review. Thanks. I'm looking forward to the whole book. I'm pleased to get this advanced copy, but yeah. There'd be an opening somewhere where maybe I could get to see you. Oh, know. I hope so. I hope so. Hey, everyone. Um, I am really happy to be here to be reading uh, a little excerpt of Alicia Soshin's uh, um, from our book of fish growing lungs. Uh, Alicia was one of my MFA students at University of South Florida. And the joke that I always say about her is that I would get probably five or 10 emails a day um, asking me questions. And I would probably see her in my office probably at least twice a day um, when, I'm in, when I'm in the building. Uh, she, but she's an incredible writer. So uh, please, please, this, this book comes out uh, June 9th. So go please, please order it. I'm going to read a little section uh, near the end of the book from an essay called Indie Night, at, Indie Night at the Goth Club. And I chose this because um, it's set, a lot of it's set in the castle. And this castle is the weirdest place ever um, in Ybor. Ybor is a historical neighborhood in Tampa. Um, and it's about music. And I think one of the things that is really great about this book is that it's talking about illness and mental health, but it's looking at it through various lenses. And, and this one talks about it through music and dance. 
I first heard of the castle a decade before becoming a Thursday night regular. The place had mythos. An ex's friend who worked as a dominatrix spent weekends there with her clients. Later, my college friends would tell me convoluted stories of their late night, a late night there. I'd listen and sigh, and then as soon as classes ended, head in the opposite direction of Ivor, driving home over a 10 mile bridge. The castle pulled at my imagination, but I stayed away. As embarrassing and dramatic as it sounds now, I was afraid. The aesthetics of my adolescent had swung violently between having too many feelings and wanting to have absolutely none. And the inevitable fallout resulted in overcommitment to responsibility. I quit doing the fun drugs and started taking the right ones. I moved down the Eastern seaboard. I went back to school full time the semester before my 21st birthday. I arranged my new life in such a way that no conditions could lead to relapse of either substance or mood. No more powder, no more late nights, no more psych wards. This was, I thought, the task of becoming a real girl, of growing up and getting well, working and working and working until my restless energy was spent, not having too much fun, lest it tip into another dangerous upward spiral. My, adolesc my adolescent CD collection was full of Tipper Gore's parental advisory stickers. I also kicked toes in my bedroom walls. In some ways, it was all very predictable. I brought myself a ticket to see S Slipknot and travel 60 miles to the, to the concert. This was after Paul Gray, their founding bassist, had died of an accidental overdose, after they'd stopped setting one another on fire during their performances. Slipknot became popular in the late 90s, and they're still performing and making music 20 years later. It's still a big production. Contrary to the myth of my high school years, their masks are not taken from Nightmare Before Christmas. And I suppose one good thing about being in a mass band is that aging is much less apparent. I only recognized half the songs, but I knew all the words to the familiar ones. I heard rumors about their drummer playing on a rotating platform that would eventually spin him upside down, but they proved unfounded. At the end of the night, I caught one of the guitar picks thrown into the audience. I had turquoise hair at the time, and it was pouring rain when I left the auditorium. I rode home drenched and screaming with adrenaline. The next morning, the back of my neck looked bruised from where I'd taken on the color of my hair, but I went to work regardless. Another time, I spent a few hours lying on the ground, baking in May, May, uh, May Atlanta heat, listening to the Deftones. This was at a day-long festival, and I was too tired to stand close to the stage or run through a mosh pit, but also unwilling to go home. I'd reached the point of simultaneous thirst and eating the pee, yet it was worth it. I imagined the cover of their self-titled album, Roses and a Skull. Only the drums' vibrations in the earth kept me from feeling like I was floating away. I'd said before I liked loud, fast music as a teenager, as if it's something I outgrew. This is misleading. I still routinely frighten unsuspecting passengers with the sound of booming double-time drums when I start my car's engine. This, by the way, is so true. I jump up and down until it feels like my neck is going to let my head fly right off my body. It's been a decade since I've hit a wall. Flash forward to my weekly Thursday nights, the transition from fearful atheism to, racing, to, the sun, uh, to sun, uh, racing the sun to sleep was boring, gradual, involved lots of therapy and happened without my noticing. It seemed like one night I was afraid of what it would mean to see 3 a.m. too many times in a row. And then the next I was standing in my kitchen after dinner, making coffee and grabbing a Red Bull out of the fridge. How many times can we put on a costume until it's no longer a costume? Our way home from dancing, I think my friends and I are all, a little, uh, are all a little in love. They have seen a sliver of the person I used to be, even if it's couched and dressed up and, pr and play pretend. I feel exhausted and unburdened. I've been struck neither drunk or ma nor manic. Nothing triggered, nothing spiraled. My fear is unfounded. It feels like some kind of magic. Of course, I've not yet ascended beyond my resentments and my taste in music hasn't much improved but I'm lucky to have survived growing up. 
The girl I once was and the woman I am now can both agree on this. Thankfully, there are no mirrors on the dance floor. There you have it. Um, this is an incredible book. Please, please, please go get it. Thank you so much, Ira. Yeah, that that little moment that was that was you in the car, as you know, as yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I remember. My ears remember. Um, so I'm going to read um, an excerpt from Noisy Neighbor, which is in Ira's Buddha's Dog collection. Um, part of being, you know, locked in the house. Uh, means that some things that you read when you were not locked in the house feel really different now that you are locked in the house. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to share this with you. I'm just going to read the first few pages of the essay, but it's, it's a good one. Noisy neighbor. In college, when most 18-year-olds discover a passion for bass-thumping woofers, 3 a.m. tripped fire alarms, and of course, gratuitous sighs of neighbors busily making love, I realized that I couldn't tolerate noise. I wasn't a prude, but I expected my neighbors to have the common courtesy to shut off their radios at night, to use what my second grade teacher referred to as our six-inch voices. When I lived with my roommate in Southern Illinois, our neighbors would wander in drunk at three in the morning, blast some bass pumping music and pass out. Meanwhile, our walls shook, the floor shook, our belongings toppled over from the seismic energy. It would have been easy to walk over and knock on their door and tell them to turn it down. Instead, I waited, my muscles tight, for the moment my roommate would jump out of bed and rage. He cussed spit flying everywhere. And then the bare knuckled punches on a wall, I'm sorry, on a wooden door or cement wall. Yes, the noise did bother me, but it was the waiting for the freak out that was worse. A year under these conditions made me a light sleeper. I became a person who waited for sound. The apartment complex was comprised of several two floor buildings. Each building had a total of eight units. The walls were thin, of course, and I heard conversations about the hottie in 7D or the unfair political science professor who thought he was in Harvard and not Saluki country where expectations were a little lower. One of my first neighbors, a sandy haired blonde guy named Keith, I accidentally got his mail once, had a new girlfriend. Keith was the type of guy with the gas guzzling SUV that took up two parking spots. He had acquired a new girlfriend and it didn't take long before they became connected in the biological sense. For a month, like clockwork, they had sex at least once a day. They preferred doing it before dinner, which was my dinner time. And though I was entertained by the cornucopia of sounds like porn on the radio, it made me bitterly aware that I was single. Sex came earlier one day, but something wasn't right. Keith's sounds I knew. He was a series of grunts, short bursts of breaths, and at climax, a long throaty note of satisfaction. His partner usually sounded like a high-pitched hyperventilator, like she was not getting enough air and her breath was cut short. I thought on several occasions she was going to pass out from coital delight. Keith's partner that day was not his girlfriend. So to be to be continued, but I thought that was wow. a good uh, uh, it's a little different now that we're stuck inside. <laughs> that that gave me weird, really bad flashbacks, actually, <laughs> for for a second there. Oh, I love that everything that we both wrote about music in a weird way, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I can't, I can't even imagine you at a Slipknot concert. I can't, like, like that is, yeah, yeah. 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 And I am definitely still suffering from like <laughs> all that bass or whatever that was playing when you when you drove me home one day. Mm -hmm. All right, um, we're close to the end. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Alicia. Thank um, you. Uh, it's been great. Hi, my name is Dan, um, and I'm very happy to uh, get to share a poem um, from my fellow, uh, Abby. And I've known Abby, I think, going on six years, it might be, though that seems uh, almost impossible. Um, Abby was my student at the MFA program at, at uh, Colorado State University, and 
I had the good fortune to be her um, thesis advisor, so um, feel extraordinarily uh, close to these these poems and, and close to the poet who wrote these poems and had this kind of extraordinary privilege of being witness to this vision as it as it came into being on the page and have this kind of happiness that I think every teacher uh, so dreams of, of watching um, a student and a poet I admire um, come out into the world with a book that, that genuinely matters. Um, so I'm very happy to, to read one of my favorite poems from it. And this is from the, the middle, the second section, which is um, beautifully mythic in its approach. Kawangak with Fox. I was walking up some stairs in a building. Inside parts of the building were new, but no one lived there anymore. I passed a lucky fox head on the stairs. But fox, where are your ears and your eyes and your tongue? Where is your body, your bushy tail? The head slunk past without stopping. If a fox crosses your path, an opportunity will be given you. So I followed it through the building to the roof where the sky and a woman lay dying. I used to have a garden, she said. If a fox stops and looks at you, your ambitions will be fulfilled. She took out her eyes and her tongue and placed these in my hand. She took a fox tail from under her skirts and fastened it to my spine. Where it had forked, she joined the pieces. She ran her fingers over my ears and they tickled like fur. When I looked up, she didn't have any ears, any eyes, any tongue, any tail. The head sat there, vacant in my direction. I put the fox eyes to my eyes and I could see across the sea. I put the tongue in my pocket and picked my way down the stairs unseen, following the smell of Tide. Um, I, I could go on for, um, for more minutes than, than would be appropriate here um, to talk about all that I admire and that's going on. I, I'll, I'll leave it at saying that this section opens with this profound need of being created and, and the way that creation occurs isn't in any contemporary modern psychological sense, but a deep turning back to old stories and old mythologies that are allowing the self to create herself in a book that is thinking about and seeking after identity and histories and ancestries that are the core crisis of what the vision is. Um, all the more beautiful that this transformation into a fox and the particular kind of trickstery character that the fox um, maintains begins in a book whose very first line, uh, a recording from a, a over a century year old wax cylinder um, is fox hunting and begins, last winter I had a thought go out, hunt foxes. And the strange, awful, full of all wisdom of, of having to become the thing um, that had been hunted um, in order to pursue what you yourself need to pursue, you know, that strikes me as very meaningful, quite beautiful. <coughs> That's my dog. My dog was barking only moments before. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, it's really, it kind of gives me chills hearing you read my poems. Uh, as Dan said, he was my thesis advisor and I first met Dan on a rooftop reading in New York City when I was just contemplating the idea of switching from fiction to poetry and just starting to look for schools. And so it has been incredible to share that experience with him. And with that in mind, I think I, I chose today to read a poem from one of his first collections that I had read when I was deciding on poetry. Um, and it's interesting to see how, how much it still resonates today. So this is Tomb Figurine from Circle's Apprentice. The field was blank, then the body lay down. The body lay down on the grain. When the body grew blank, the grain grew blossomed. The blossoms made an absence of the body. Among them, 
The blossoms could not be counted, so the body was one. The flowering grain was empty. Pressure on a stone creates a mountain. Less pressure creates a mountain and fog. The body supine in the field sees from an angle the pines hover over the mountains. The body bears a weight. The weight is blank. Trees and mountains echo in the field. The sky is cloudless. The echo is in the eye. And I have a note actually from the first time I read this poem that just says crisp matter of fact economy of language. Um, back when I was trying to decide what strong poems do. And in returning to this poem, it was shortly after I had read in Song and Silence where um, Dan, you quote Gertrude Stein, there is no repetition, only insistence, though you suggest instances instead in your memory. And in that work, as in this, there's a sense of an asymptotic approach to living or this question of living, though I don't think it's an answer we're looking for as poets so much as an understanding of our responsibility, uh, perhaps as living beings of this world that we imagine, as you write in the following poem, and so as to invite others in via these circuitous grammars that shift with each utterance with each attempt to fix any single point. And it's this insistence that I think drove a lot of my own work and that I looked for in a lot of poetry that continues to speak to me today. And also, um, I guess in context of everything going on, why we continue to write poems and why they continue to speak to us beyond the current moment is, is that pressure to approach some other through language. Um, you read that poem more beautifully than I've ever read it myself. Um, and, and what I hear um, most profoundly and which I feel um, so deeply in your work is that the poem isn't actually pursuing understanding, it's seeking after responsibility. Um, and to not confuse those two things, so to understand that that responsibility in a poem opens us up not only to a kind of ethical dimension, but um, a perceptive one too, that, that we're here not only to be responsible, but to figure out how to respond and, and to respond, uh, as you're also saying right now, um, to respond in the midst of radically uncertain kinds of time. Um, and the poems and, and poets I admire are, are such good, good helps in that difficult work yeah, I find myself when when questioned about, you know, how I'm writing poems to this moment and if I'm writing poems about the pandemic per se and and I find that the answer is not so much in in trying to capture the specifics of the moment um fixed in that time but but trying to reach beyond it and trying to find ways in which something that 6 years later still resonates so deeply and can be uh used to approach such radically different times. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the wonderful gift to be able to return to the instant of a poem you love and have it be new is, is, is a radical medicine for right now. It is indeed. Um, thank you so much for, for choosing me as your fellow and of course for all of your mentoring throughout these years. And well, thanks, for, thanks for agreeing and, and thanks for doing this work. I, um, I'm a fan. <laughs> which is incredible to hear. And of course I am a fan as well. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. you as well. Thank you for tuning in to week one of the Kenyon Review summer series in a few words. Please join us again next Tuesday for our second installment, which will feature David Baker and Lee Lachetti, Eric Gordon and Beth Lambert, E.J. Levy and Claire Boyles, Dinty W. Moore and Angelique Stevens, Shara McCallum, and E.G. Goodman Asher. And as we wrap up our time together, please consider supporting the Kenyon Review with a donation, which you can make by clicking the button at the bottom of your screen. See you again soon. Good night.